Good afternoon, students. Welcome to the class. Uh, we're here to talk about energy economics and analysis modeling. Uh, and welcome, too, to the audience who's watching this uh, later as a, a replay. There are a total of eight classes. I will be meeting for a little under two hours for uh, the eight times. And I've divided up my lectures into eight uh, sections. They don't exactly uh, match up with the uh, lecture series. Uh, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't come out evenly, in other words, with the uh, precise amount of things that we're talking about. Uh, I think what we're talking about here is that what happens when you have growth in a finite world and how this situation can play out. Uh, it, it's a situation that's kind of hard to understand. Uh, and it's something that we hear a lot about in many different ways. Uh, people, on one hand, are concerned about it and, and are concerned that maybe we'll have high prices. There are other people who are concerned about it and think that, well, maybe uh, we'll have lots of new supply. Uh, there's just a lot of different ways of thinking about it. But I think a lot of what we hear in the press really isn't quite right. So I'd like to look at it uh, the way I see it and try to uh, explain it to you the way I see it. Let's start out when I will talk a little bit about some of the ways we're reaching limits. So now we have to dig deeper holes or we have to go deep under the ocean to get the oil. We have to use more energy to get energy out but it, it's, a, it's a much more expensive process. Mm -hmm. well, now that, uh, that we've taken the easy to extract oil out of the ground. Uh, so this is one of the kinds of limits that we're reaching. Another kind that you're probably very aware of is with coal here in this country, since China uses so much coal. And uh, we have the same kind of issue with coal in that you use the coal that is in your own country first and then go to the imports. Uh, you use the best quality coal first and then you go to the lesser quality coal. But uh, coal has other kinds of issues as well. It's not uh, just that it's lower quality coal, it also has pollution problems. Not to say that these other things don't have pollution problems, but with coal, there's a little bit more of them, you know, both in terms of smog and both in, and in terms of CO2. I'm sure you've all heard about those kinds of issues. Uh, but at the same time, we're reaching limits in oil and coal. Uh, water is another area, fresh water in particular that we uh, are reaching limits on. Um, I think it, we've all heard that uh, Beijing uh, is in a quite dry area. And you know, it needs to get water from elsewhere. Uh, if you have to start moving water from uh, at quite a distance, that becomes a problem. Uh, and we use water in oil extraction and then coal extraction and natural gas extraction and in making the finished products that we make from these things. So if there's a shortage of water, then that affects the other things. So we're reaching limits in many different ways at the same time. Uh, I think you've all heard about these. In metals, one thing I hadn't realized when I first started out, you know, so often people talk about we have fossil fuel shortages. You know, we start with a limited supply of them, or at least a limited supply that's easy to get out. But when it comes to metals, it's similar. We start with a, a limited supply that's easy to extract from metals as well. Uh, we have uh, ore 
the, the term it is ores for when you get your metals using uh, say for iron you use iron ore where you would use the best quality iron ore that you could find and you'd also use the iron ore that's closest to where you are uh, living you know, where you don't get to transport at long distance if it's at all possible uh, but so you would use that first but then once you use the easy to extract metals then you have to go on to hard to extract metals so they have their own kind of uh, limits that are very similar to the fossil fuel limits and I think sometimes we don't realize that uh, and then a different kind of uh, problem that affects us is population. Uh, the population keeps rising. Even when you have one child families, you can still have the population rising because so many people some live so much longer. So some of the older people keep living longer and you still end up with a rising population. Certainly a lot less with one child families. But, and over time it would go down. But um, it's been the situation is, and as you get more people, then you have more need to use the same amount of farmland to provide food for a larger group of people. And you also need to get more resources out uh, to provide housing and other such things for all these people. So all of this uh, leads to uh, kind of a situation where we're trying harder and harder just to get the same resources out that we would have in the past, or at least the same resources that we would for each person in the past. Okay, I'm just going to ask you a question. Uh, so, I think, what do you folks know about what the economists have been telling us? I tried to put a little bit here together. And uh, the economists have put together a story that they tell us in the newspapers or anywhere. And the basic story that you get from the economists is that the economy can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And grow. Now, in a world that has limits, how can that happen? Have any of you thought, you know, that maybe this wouldn't make sense? You know, if you start out with a world that's only this big and you're taking more and more of all of the resources out of it, at some point it's going to be, become, there's going to be conflict there. But the economists have put together models as if we could continue to grow and the economy could continue to grow pretty much indefinitely. Uh, there's no breaks, no, no way of stopping the growth. Um, and of course, this model pleased the politicians to no end because, you know, <laughs> great, next year is just as good as next year. It's last year. Of course, uh, China's economic growth now is starting to what, 7% this next year instead of 7.4%, which is 10% a few years ago. Uh, so it doesn't really quite go that way. It really goes a little bit differently than that. Uh, so the way the economists look at things, uh, the economic growth, did, at least in one of the models that you hear an awful lot about, they talk about labor and capital. Uh, so what would labor be? That would be what you, the worker, do. does, right? And capital, what would that be? You know what the capital is? It's, it's, uh, let's see. What, what would you say the capital is? 
Uh, I think it may refer to a big city or something like that. I think, I think what they're thinking of is, is really like the machines and all of the things that you've been able to buy and put together in the past uh, and you've accumulated the wealth to, you know, if you're going to uh, make some new products, you need people to do it, but then you also have accumulated all of these things. You've put together a factory and you've put together the uh, you, and you have the machines within the factory, you've been able to buy this big factory. So this capital is all <coughs> this stuff that you put together that allow you to make things. And in the way they put together their model, they really just talk about labor and capital, but then this kind of magic comes along, which they call technology improvements or technological improvements. And so over time, you can make more and more stuff out of less and less inputs. Well, to some extent, you know, your cars, you can make them so they're more efficient. But, um, you know, and that you can, there are other things that we can make more efficient too. We can make, uh, an electric power plant more efficient, for example. But uh, there are limits. You know, the uh, physicists will tell us that there's only so much that we can do in order to, uh, above a certain limit, we can't keep adding things. So, so they, they credit technology, technology for being a big factor in the growth that we've been experiencing. And they really haven't talked about energy as being a big factor in what's happening. Um, so the way they think of it, the way most of us would think about it, what would you think that the role of energy would be. If you're going to make something, you probably are going to have to have some electricity, or you're going to have to have some oil, diesel, or some gasoline, or something uh, to provide the, the work, the energy that makes uh, what you're doing happen. So most of us would think that energy is required in this process of making things. But the economists only look at it from a different point of view. They look at it from a point of view of that, which is the flip side of it, which is that once you have some money, then you can buy the energy product, which is true. <laughs> and there's really nothing really wrong with that part of the statement, which is really what is kind of uh, surprising. I mean, a lot of people have said, well, this isn't quite right. But if you don't have a job, you're not going to think about buying a car. You probably won't think about buying a car even if you do have a job. But if you don't have a job, it's definitely out of the question. But getting a good job is the first thing that, that you need in order to afford a lot of these things. So I think what I will be talking about is that it's really a two-way tie, that energy makes, energy, excuse me, uh, that energy does, uh, makes the goods, but it also, energy products and various types make the goods, but at the same time, uh, it's the fact that we earn wages because of these energy products that allows us to be able to afford to buy the, the products that we need. So it, it's, it's both a supply situation and an affordability situation. It, it, it's really a two-way kind of a time.
We'll talk more about that later. But the economists think of it only on, in the direction that, it, or at least that's one thing I want to talk about, and is that it's because you have the job that you can afford the energy, and they don't think about it the other way. Uh, one of the pieces of the way economists think about the situation is uh, they think about supply and demand. And, and I think I'll make a, available these slides to you. I'm not sure exactly how we do it so that they're available online so that you can see what I've got written down here because I think it might be easier for you if you can go back and look at what the words say. I know somebody's talking in a different language than they're used to. Sometimes it's easier to have the written word as well. And just, even if you do speak this language, sometimes it's helpful to be able to go back and look at it. So I'll try to make sure that the, the slides are made available to you. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is supply and demand and how that operates. And at least if you believe the economists, you know, they, they have put together a story which is not when we're running short on supply. It's a story that was from 200 years ago or 100 years ago. It's from a long time ago. I don't know the exact time. And based on what happened then, the kind of story they come up with is that if there's not enough of the resource, then the system will adapt. And the way they see this as happening is that if you don't have enough, the price of the resource, for example, oil, will go up. And when the price goes up, then the buyers, you know, they're going to conserve. They won't use as much of it. You know, if it's um, something where they could, <coughs> homeowners could get, uh, use less of it by putting, adding insulation to their homes, for example, example, they will use some more insulation. And when they add this additional insulation, then they will, uh, be able to cut back on their use of oil or coal or whatever it is if the price is too high. So one of the directions that will help it, they believe, is that the buyers will conserve. Another thing is they expect is that substitutes will be found. And, and of course the substitutes would be, they would expect would be, for instance, wind turbines instead of coal or any other kind of substitute that they might come up with, or gas, uh, maybe gas from coal uh, instead of uh, coal, if the coal itself is very polluting, maybe the gas from coal will have different kinds of pollution issues. Uh, but Okay, then the other thing that helps to balance the system is that at a higher price, the, uh, the more of the scarce resource will be produced. So if the price of oil goes up, then the idea would be that there would be more, uh, that, you know, they would uh, be willing to extract oil from uh, places that they would never even consider before. They might be willing to dig deeper uh, or go to uh, less hospitable areas, areas that are frozen over, you know, near the North Pole or whatever, so that they're in a very uh, bad area for actually uh, getting the oil out. Uh, and the economists are in the view that the, the system will rebalance itself. You know, the price will go up and everything will come out well because somehow or other these combination of these different effects will all kind of work their way together so that the buyers come back, the substitutes will be developed, uh, there's going to be more produced, 
and everything magically happily ever after, and the economy will keep on growing. And so, okay. So the result is there's nothing to worry about. Politicians are happy because they don't have to tell their people that there's any problem ever. I can say, re-elect me. You know, I should be running this operation forever. So, because the system will fix itself. So, and so this is the, you know, what the economists are telling us. And based on, you know, if you're looking back at it 50 or 100 years ago, and you developed your models at that point in time, maybe that's not too bad a, an assumption as to how it works. If you're, the situation changes as you get close to limits, but there's no reason to put together your model as if you're going to reach limits, if you're a long ways from limits, because, well, you know, why should you do that? You know how it works now, and and if the price goes up a little bit, you know, you can it gets more out, everything will be fine. So then the question is, what's the real story? And this is the, the difficult question that researchers have been trying to tackle. And of course, the researchers that are trying to tackle it aren't particularly economists. Uh, and they look at the story and they say, well, okay, something is wrong here. But exactly what's wrong? Is it, you know, is the story that the economist telling us wrong? Is it, you know, what part of the story is wrong? And, you know, should we throw out this part and that part and the other part? And so what happens is that different people work on this project and they don't necessarily get all of the answers the first time through. You know, it's kind of a story where different people have to work on it and each of them kind of try to solve a little bit of the problem because it's not an easy situation. It's not a, an easy thing to figure out the answer to. Um, really what we need is an update to the entire story of the economist, but, you know, it's not easy to know exactly where you, you change this. Uh, first, I think what I'm going to do is just show a few slides about what has happened recently with oil, and then we're going to look at the ideas of uh, three influential people who looked at this. And of course, as you'll see, none of these people are, are really economists. Uh, M. King Hubbard is a geologist. Uh, Dennis Meadows was the head of a, a group uh, that modeled what was going on uh, in, in a book they called Limits to Growth. And his wife, Danella, was the one who wrote up the uh, model. And she probably was quite influential as to what in, went into the model. Uh, she's no longer alive, but he is. And they were assistance analysts, and they looked at it from uh, kind of a how much there is going in and going out kind of point of view. And then Charles Hall is another well-known uh, person in this field, and he came as an ecologist. So none of these people really came at it from the economist's point of view. They came at it from some different perspectives, and they added some of their thoughts, which were helpful, but it's a difficult question, so you kind of have to have different people building different parts of the story together to get the whole story. So let's first look at a few things about oil production. And I don't know how much of this you're familiar with. Uh, this is uh, the, you know, the United States was the first one to really ramp up oil production. And M. King Hubbard, that we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, was one who back in 1956, which would be back here, said, well, you know, the oil companies are assuming the production is just going to go up and up and up and up and up. But based on what we know about how much oil there is and 
what kind of techniques that we have for getting it out, that oil production is going to, we're going to reach a limit on how much we can get out. And that limit is going to come about 1970. And when that limit comes, instead of it keeping going up and up and up and up, it's going to start turning around and going down. And at the time Hubbard was talking about this, the, nobody had really set his work in Alaska. This, that's the red part here. Uh, and of course they hadn't developed all of this shale stuff, it's the new stuff. But it, so when he was talking back in 1956, it, the oil production had come from, well, my next slide will show where it comes from further than this. But it had come from a very low level, and it got up to here. And uh, up to here, everybody assumed it was just going to keep on going up. They certainly knew that there was a big amount there, and they assumed that as long as it was, you knew you had it in your reserves, you could just keep getting it out as fast as you want. Well, that's not really quite the way it works, though. Uh, the water, as you get out more and more of it, you get a bigger water cut, they call it. You get a smaller percentage oil and more water, and it takes more effort to get out the oil. So it, it, it becomes very difficult to get it out very quickly. And uh, so this is what you know the longer term view, at least for the United States, looks like. Now on a world basis, what's happened is uh, I've shown here that the amount of supply is this line here. And back in 1900, it was very, very low. And this would be mostly the US, but I think so. Saudi Arabia and a few other countries uh, had started to produce quite early on. And, uh, and Russia did too. And so the production was going up at quite a steep slope here, and the consumption was going up at the same time, of course. Production and consumption are essentially the same amount. In other words, the amount we pull out of the ground and the amount people use, you don't have much storage capacity. So they tend to be about the same amounts. So what happened here was that the production went up and up and up, and it was going at up at a steep slope, and everybody's buying new cars, driving around, at least in the United States, and uh, maybe uh, Japan and in Europe. And so then, right about here, that if you remember on the previous slide, uh, that was 1970 when we got to this big, oh my goodness, it started going down. This isn't so good. And so then the prices that went right, went up as soon as the, uh, the production, we hit this bump in the uh, oil production. And there was also some international kinds of things with uh, the Arab oil embargo, but it wasn't really, that wasn't really the issue. It was more just the fact that the oil wasn't coming out anymore and we needed oil from elsewhere and there was really a shortage there. And so what happened in here uh, was that, the, that everyone said, we've really got to cut back, we've got to figure out what we're doing wrong. Uh, and in the United States, we had very big cars, and every year they would have a new model come out, and a new model would look different. So there would be, uh, but in Japan, they sold smaller cars, and they were more fuel efficient cars. So uh, the United States cut back on, you know, started to make smaller cars also. So that was one of the things that happened. And I think I've got some slides that talk a little bit about that, maybe not today, but on another day. Uh, so there were various things we could do. I think another thing that happened was that, that early on, we were uh, making electricity by burning oil. Well, making electricity by burning oil, we could also use coal, 
which is a whole lot cheaper now, and it certainly was by the time you got the prices way up in here, you certainly wouldn't want to be using this terribly expensive oil to be making electricity, you could just as well be making it out of coal or even natural gas. Um, so we cut back and we ended up with a different slope of line. It's a, it, it wasn't growing as fast later, but it's continued to grow. And we had, after that spike, the price came down, but it didn't come down as far as it had We built, in the United States, we built all of our roads and all of our schools and, and all of a lot of things back when the price of oil was about $20 a barrel, which was quite low compared to what the price was, I guess, then, recently. And so, let me show you what's happened. Recently, though, this is, you know, the long-term view from 1900 up to 2012. So now if we go and look at it in a little more detail, what's happened is that uh, starting in the year 2000, the oil price started going up again, yeah, but the oil, the volume didn't go up very much. I mean, it was kind of gradually going up. And then it spiked in 2008, and we had a big recession, and it dropped, the price dropped greatly. And it was actually when they did a lot of changes to try to lower interest rates and made a lot of financial changes to try to get the price, well, I don't know. They didn't say they wanted to get the price back up again, but that was really one of the things they wanted to do. And they finally got the price back up again, and now, recently, what has happened is oil prices dropped. So we've had some really big gyrations in prices uh, and not nearly as big changes in the uh, oil supply. Looked at on a longer scale, we just looked at this before. On a longer scale, what's happened is that the oil supply has continued to sort of go up in a straight line, but this line isn't really complete. If it was drawn down far enough, it would go down, back down to here again. It fell back down again. So this is kind of an overview of what has happened. Now, if we go to M. King Hubbard, he was a geologist and a physicist uh, who uh, worked for an oil company. And he observed that the extraction of uh, minerals of many kinds tends to follow a symmetric curve. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And this has to do with the geology of the situation. It becomes more and more difficult to get the oil out, or just anyhow. And he was the one that correctly forecast the 1970 uh, decline in the U.S. oil production. But he also forecast that the, about 2000, the world oil supply would go down. But his forecast wasn't really right, at least the timing wasn't right, on the 2000 uh, oil supply, uh, because it's continued to increase. Um, and he hadn't really considered the new effect, new techniques and the effect of higher prices. Uh, the, the kind of curve that M.P. Hubbard showed, that this is one from his 1956 paper, Nuclear Energy and the Fossil Fuels. And so what he was saying was this was the cut shape of the <coughs> curve that you would expect and you might get some, it might be a little bit wider on this side because of new discoveries, but what he was trying to forecast was sort of the blue barrier we just looked at in the uh, one back, remember back here? Oh, that one. So he was trying to put together a chart of what this would look like, and he said that it ought to look like this. And, uh, and it, it represents 
he had figured out that it, there was going to be exactly this much barrels of oil. And then once you knew that barrel of oil, then you kind of spread it out using this curve. Of course, he wasn't right. He, his estimate was too low. Uh, one thing that people don't often think about, though, is that the model that Hubbard was talking about was the situation, he's looking at the situation when one field declines, like in the United States, when our oil supply went down, then uh, the Alaskan, the part in Alaska that we hadn't started, and uh, the uh, North Sea oil uh, went online. Uh, when there's, and also I think Mexico was another place that had oil supply. So when there's other fields to replace the oil, then you have a, a, a kind of a different situation than when you don't have a replacement. Uh, they, as long as it, the situation is just that one field declines and others are there to replace it, then the, the, you get the model that Hubbard had. If the economy depends on oil, then there's no real problem because, okay, this field declined, you know, we can't get oil from the United States, we'll get it from the North Sea, or we'll get it from Mexico, or we'll get it from Russia, or we'll get it from China, or whoever has the oil. So <coughs> the economy can continue as in the past as long as you had enough oil or enough whatever the resources were in, in total. Um, and Hubbard's analysis also makes it clear that the, the world supply must decline, but the catch that people don't understand or realize is that the shape of the world curve isn't necessarily the, the, the shape of the individual areas because we're, we have a very different situation when you don't have a replacement product. You know, if you have a replacement product, then you can continue to drive your cars. Oh, so I need my bottle of water here, I think. And you can, uh, so what in fact is happening is his curve represents the slowest kind of decline that, there, that, that you can have. So what happens is that, uh, let me show you the next slide here. If you look at Hubbard's paper, what he talks about is he says, okay, the situation I'm talking about is even before we hit the peak, and this is at the time they thought nuclear energy would save the world. And so he said, we're going to double, you know, we'll take the nuclear energy from nothing up to, you know, double what the fossil fuels were. We'll send it way up here. And in fact, when he talked about this in one of his papers, he talks about making liquid fuels using nuclear energy. And so he was assuming you could run your cars off the fuel that you made from nuclear energy. And you could run, you know, all of your machinery off the fuels you could make from nuclear energy. So it wasn't like you were running short of oil was a problem, a complete problem. It was a problem you already had fixed because you had fixed it with something else. And here he talks about it with nuclear energy. And as long as it's, you got it fixed, then there's no, what sometimes called above ground problems. Anybody know what an above ground problem is? Very often they talk about uh, an above ground problem is, for instance, if uh, the government of a country is overthrown, uh, of an oil exporter is overthrown because they don't have enough tax revenue and the situation is very bad in that country then the, uh, the government will, um, if it's overthrown, then 
then the entire production would stop, or close to the production would stop, would drop off much more quickly. You know, if you had a situation where there wasn't, uh, you know, if the if the oil fields were overrun by people who were unhappy, who wanted to blow up the pipelines, for example, you're suddenly going to have a situation where your production drops off a lot more quickly. So it's not the same situation. If you've got some kind of replacement in here and you keep everybody happy, then you're going to use it over a long period of time. But if everybody is very unhappy and they just lost their jobs and they're out blowing up oil fields and they're blowing up pipelines, you're going to have a very different situation. Uh, so what's happened is that the believers in peak oil have uh, developed a variety of beliefs and I think you know there are a lot of different beliefs that you get. Different people have different ideas. Uh, Typically, what they say, they believe, is some of the same things that the economists believe. And remember, I was saying we don't, you know, we don't start out knowing which part of what the economists are telling us is wrong. All you know is, well, they told us something. And so, what they believe is that the their view of how this works is that the oil will decline, and quite often they believe first the oil will decline. And then the gas will, no, then the, the coal will decline after the oil. And then the gas after the coal. But, you know, and then it sort of, it would, um, and the economy will react to this decline. That's the view that you quite often get. Uh, and then the economy will face a shortage of this oil and the coal and the gas. And so the concern with the peak oil belief was that we need to mitigate, we need to make up for this lack of oil or coal or natural gas. So, so this is one kind of view of it. And so the view that people tend to think is that the oil extraction will follow a hover curve. The, the, you know, the curve went like this before, okay, it's going to do exactly the same thing before. Well, maybe, but anyhow. But and what I would say is it will follow that if there's a cheap replacement. If we've got a cheap replacement already in place, so that everybody continue to drive their cars and business continue to hire people, then it follows a hover curve. It doesn't in general. It's only if you've got a cheap replacement there. Already in place. Another frequent belief of peak oilers is that prices will rise. Uh, and furthermore, the belief is that the oil supply is going to decline despite these high prices. Uh, with the high prices, what happens is that it becomes quite easy to do substitution. Uh, this substitution will take place over a period of years uh, because uh, with high oil prices, then if the alternatives are also high priced, it becomes more easy to substitute from the high oil price to the high, to the high price of the substitute because you know, if you're used to one high oil price, you can move to a high substitute. The assumption here is that life is going to go on pretty much as it has in the past. It's not a real big problem. We just move from one, uh, from one high priced uh, source of energy to another high source of energy. Uh, the belief is that we'll learn to adapt to this lower fuel use and uh, things will be pretty much all right. Uh, the, these beliefs are really based on the economist model of the system uh, since peak oilers, when they're looking at it, are really dealing with the system, uh, their understanding of how other people see things and in particular how the uh, economists see things. So it's not really entirely Hubbard's view 
of what happens to oil supply. It's really Hubbard's view of oil supply in combination with the uh, oil supply, uh, the, the view of the economists. There really are several different possible outcomes that were not considered by peak oilers. One of them is that the fuels will become too high priced for consumers, but the wages don't rise. Uh, if this happens, we have a problem. Uh, if we've got the, a high price for, uh, of the fuel, but the wages are down here, then it becomes too expensive. And instead of the prices rising, what you could have is the price of all of the commodities falling because of lack of affordability. And if you have a lack of affordability, the system could quite quickly fail because of low prices. Uh, you, you really need a high price to get a high priced product out of the ground. And this is things some people haven't really thought through. If this happens, substitution isn't really going to work well at all. So, you know, this is a different kind of an outcome than the high price scenario that the peak oilers have often uh, thought about. Now, if we go through, uh, going back to our list of these original people who have talked about uh, oil limits and energy limits, uh, let's talk about Dennis Meadows. Uh, he was uh, one of the uh, lead people behind uh, a study called Limits to Growth that was done uh, in the early 1970s. And this had to do with the physical depletion of resources. Uh, Dennis Meadows led a team of researchers at MIT and they did an analysis of what would happen if you extracted uh, resources of you continually try to grow your extraction of resources from the earth and at the same time population tried to grow and uh, your government grew. Well, they didn't really model the piece of government, but the whole system would grow over time. But what would happen is they approached limits and they were doing this with physical resources. Uh, this uh, analysis was done and published in a book that was quite well known at the time called Limits to Growth. The lead author was actually uh, Dennis Meadows' wife, Danella Meadows, and uh, she was part of the research team. Uh, what they found is, or what they did, what they modeled was the impact these resources would have on the amount of food produced, the amount of goods produced, the expected growing pollution issues over time, and the greater difficulty in extracting these resources over time. So in other words, they took uh, a model, a computer model, and said, okay, we have such and such amount of uh, metals in the ground and that we think we can get out, and we have such and such amount of uh, fossil fuels, and we have other resources that we need to use. And then they tried to model this along with uh, the expected number of people this would support and the amount of food supply, how many births and how many deaths you would get. Uh, the kind of uh, result that they got uh, we have is, is shown on, in this uh, slide that I have uh, that shows they showed how this uh, situation would play out. And uh, the model, their model way back in 1972, they didn't have very good graphics, but this is updated graphics showing the kinds of things that they were expecting. And what you can see is that uh, about the time frame that we are right now, we'd start reaching limits. And as we reached limits, what would happen is you would see uh, things that had risen before, the food per capita would rise, but then at some point it would start decreasing. And the population would grow and at some point it would start decreasing. Uh, the amount of resources available would decline over time, at least the amount in the ground, the number of deaths and the births would, would change over time too. So this is the kind of thing they looked at. And, and now 
people have gone back and looked at how these forecasts really played out. And in fact, what they found was that the uh, actual experience has been pretty close to the 1972 model. What they looked at was the economy first, and uh, what they showed was in, let's see, services per capita, food per capita, and industrial output per capita, and those all grew fairly rapidly, and uh, sort of along the trajectory they planned they expected, and the population grew more or less along the trajectory expected. The birth rate and the death rate, well, I guess they're both a little lower than they expected, but the, the population net came out about the same. And then in terms of the environment, uh, they foresaw a big increase in pollution, and in fact, there has been uh, quite a big increase in pollution. So, they're, so far, their model seems to be working fairly well. The question we have is how will this situation really work out? Uh, the collection of models that was put together was put together way back in the 1970s, and that really was more than uh, 40 years ago. So this is quite a while, a while ago, you know, is, is it really right? And another thing is that you know, they were trying to simplify the situation. They were not trying to model everything. Uh, they didn't uh, include the financial system, including debt. They didn't include how governments would fare if there was a shortage of resources. And they didn't look at the impact of having multiple countries and those countries uh, competing with one another. So, they had a simplified model, which was pretty good, you know, looking at physical resources. And based on that, they're saying, oh, we're likely to run into a problem, but, you know, the details they couldn't really get at. Uh, one of the things is that the, the shape of the downward slope, in other words, once it goes up, how does it come back down again, is quite possibly wrong because of these omissions of not including, for instance, the financial system. And the, the bias or the, the kinds of omissions they have are very similar to the biases and the omissions in the peak oil analyses. They look at the geological uh, types of changes that, that might happen but they don't really look at the above ground problems, you know, the civil wars that might happen, for example, or changes to the debt system, changes uh, because of governments collapsing, for example. So we really don't know exactly how this will work out, but, but the 1972 book seems to do, have done a pretty decent job way back then, when, based on what we know now. The next person we'll talk about is Professor, Professor Charles Hall, who recently re retired from uh, the University of, uh, State University of New York at Sy Syracuse. And he comes from the field of ecology. He be began work in the early 1970s in response to the issues uh, raised by Meadows. So he knows Dennis Meadows and they're all thinking about the same kinds of things. And he's one who's known for the considerable amount of research he has done uh, connecting energy with economic growth and particularly showing that energy is necessary for economic growth. And I think this is an important issue and he's done important work in uh, this area. Uh, it, he's worked at refuting one of the major beliefs of economists uh, namely that you can have economic growth without energy. Uh, this is very often, as I mentioned earlier, the belief is that as long as you, it's more of a demand issue, uh, if, as long as people, as long as the economy is growing, there's going to be more and more demand for energy. But here, uh, the real situation is that the, the economy needs energy too. So, uh, and in particular, one of the things he looked at was the thermodynamic connection between the work done by the oil 
and the economic growth because it takes energy to heat up things, it takes energy to move things. So uh, there's a, a real physical connection between energy, oil and energy, or coal and energy, and the way the economy grows. And because of this connection between energy and the economy, if the energy, the amount of avail available energy declines, then the economy must necessarily shrink. Uh, so if you have a shrinking oil supply, then the economy must shrink. Uh, and his, so Ch Professor Charles Hall's writing follows the view that the economy can and will shrink. Professor uh, Hall developed a metric called energy return on energy invested. Have any of you uh, thought about this before, or run into this? Anyhow. Uh, I see several of you have. Anyhow, the, this uh, is really a measure of diminishing returns. It, it's a me measure of uh, how much more difficult it is to do your extraction now than it was to do it earlier. How much more energy is required in doing uh, your extraction at the given point today than it was an er at an earlier period. In particular, the calculation is the energy output uh, divided by the energy input uh, with uh, a high energy output relative to the energy input being good. You'd like to get lots and lots of energy out in terms of uh, with very little input. This uh, method was adapted from the field of ecology. Uh, in particular, uh, Professor Hall looked at earlier at how fish uh, what their decision was in terms of food supply and they always chose food supply where they could get enough energy so that it made sense for them to swim upstream far enough to get that energy. Uh, they didn't uh, pursue food sources that were too expensive in some sense uh, relative to the energy that they got out of it. So he was looking at the kind of relationship that they look at in uh, an ecological, from a study of ecology, uh, assuming it was a fairly similar kind of situation here. And as I mentioned earlier, the high energy return on energy invested is good. Getting lots out with little input is good. And low energy return on energy invested is bad. And of course, one of the things that happens when you have a situation like this is that you can make your energy supply go as far as possible by using the high energy return on energy invested fuels. If we're limited in the amount that's in the ground, and that's the big concern, then it makes sense uh, instead of using lots and lots of fuels uh, in your extraction, if you can kind of reduce them there, that by itself will help you in having enough uh, energy to go around. Uh, in theory, we can rank fuels regarding how good they are based on the energy return on energy invested. Uh, and of course, with this, the high EROI is good. In a sense, high energy return on energy invested corresponds to low cost to produce uh, types of resources, and low energy return on energy invested corresponds to high cost to produce. Uh, the reason why they don't exactly correspond, well, there's quite a few different reasons, but one of them is that this calculation doesn't include human labor. And another reason is that it doesn't differentiate between high cost fuels and low cost fuels. Uh, really though, as I sort of mentioned briefly earlier, there are two different models of future energy supply that are possible. One of them is uh, the, the version view that I favor, which, which is that energy supply will fall because 
commodity prices drop too low because of affordability issues. In other words, it's low prices, such as the low prices that we're seeing now, that are likely to be a problem. Uh, what happens in this case is that the price of fuel rises too high for consumers, but wages don't rise at the same time. So what happens is you've got these consumers who are not uh, getting, uh, who find that their wages don't go very far. Uh, the producers will pr quit producing energy pr products because they can't make enough money at it. Uh, and so what happens is, in this situation, is that all types of energy products could very well have a problem at the same time because what happens with the, the lack of affordability is that the, the consumers are cutting back in all places and it becomes a financial problem and it spreads from one place to another. And of course, we talked earlier about substitution when there are high prices. When there's low prices, the substitution doesn't really quite work as well. Uh, what happens is the people are too poor to buy expensive uh, substitutes for oil or gas. So the substitution is away completely. And what happens is that uh, you, ha you can have a failing economy. The, the peak oil view is the other alternative and it's not just a peak oil view, it's a view that's pretty widespread, and that is that oil prices will rise, and when we have these high oil prices, then substitutes are going to be possible over a long period. As the, because once the alternatives are high, people will be happy to buy a high price substitute. Uh, this, of course, the issue here is that the prices are, that people become adapted to these high prices and then somehow or other they uh, just move from one high price that type of energy supply to another high priced energy supply. Uh, so the view then is to try to become, the, to try to find the most efficient types of substitutes. Uh, these substitutes are possible even at a higher price. This, that's what the belief is because with the higher oil prices, they will, the uh, substitutes, which might be wind or solar or some such thing, will be, can compete at the high price. And if it's over a long enough period, this will allow uh, changes in technology, which will allow us to change to new types of uh, cars and trucks and such things that can use, say, electricity instead of oil. But you have to have a long period of substitution for that kind of thing to happen. And one thing that I should point out is that the problem we're trying to mitigate is really different in these two kinds of views. In view one, as I pointed out, the, the problem is the price of fuel becomes too high for the consumers. In view two, it's a different problem. It's the supply of fuel is likely to run short. These are really two different issues. One is a, a high priced issue and the, one, and the other one that comes closer to being more like running out. You, you run short of it. So it, it's quite different. Uh, the, the energy return on energy invested calculation has been developed based on view two, that the supply of fuel is likely to run short. And it, its calculation gives us a way to figure out as how we can make the supply, fuel supply go as far as possible. And so what we do is we add up all of the kinds of energy, whether they're cheap or expensive, and then if we look at the, how much energy out compared to how much energy in we have, if that ratio is high, this will extend the energy usage. So, so that's a good outcome. Uh, and the, uh, it doesn't matter if the energy, the new energy really matches the built-in infrastructure. In other words, 
It doesn't matter whether we're making electricity to replace oil because we have substitution over a long period. And over a long period, uh, maybe you can build a lot of electric cars and doing that, it, it doesn't really matter if you're, you're doing it over such a, uh, if, it's, uh, if you have to uh, start building new things, you can, you can change from oil to electricity or whatever. This view tends to be the view of peak oilers, but it also tends to be the view of the, the general public. So maybe I shouldn't blame the peak oilers for this. Maybe it, it's sort of a, a general view that everyone is believing. And in fact, there really wasn't any reason to suspect this view might be wrong until 2008. Uh, and, and back then, what we had was a situation where the, the prices really dropped. Let me see if I can see if, show you where that happened. So in 2008, we had the, the prices drop. Uh, we had thought the prices would rise all along, but in 2008, we did see that the prices dropped. And now again, we're seeing that the prices dropped. So we have to start rethinking this whole issue of is it, do the prices always go up or is there sometimes when they go down? And, and we're seeing that there's a real difference, that it doesn't always necessarily just go up. Uh, and that it, things interact, how the economy works uh, may behave differently than we had realized. So, so if you one describes the real problem, then high energy return on energy invested is not the right met metric. If the view one is right, what we need really is low cost fuels. We need to be able to have the fuels be really inexpensive from the point of view of uh, the consumer. An energy return on energy invested doesn't really measure low cost. It kind of does, but it kind of doesn't. It completely omits the human energy component, as I mentioned before. And it also emits other important aspects of cost, including the cost of integrating the new energy source into the economy, the cost of required government services, uh, you know, repairing roads, for example, if you're uh, doing a lot of fracking or whatever it is, uh, and, the, and various kinds of things. If you have private suppliers who are providing the uh, oil and the gas or whatever, they need to pay dividends and interest uh, to their, in order to get the capital required to uh, produce the energy services. And that's another part of the whole equation that really doesn't come into energy return on energy invested. So really what we're doing is dealing with a much more complicated situation than the fish swimming upstream. Uh, and as it becomes more complicated, then the, the energy return on energy invested isn't necessarily the right uh, metric. It, it may more be just a uh, cost metric than is something that we should be looking at. In fact, we do have a pretty good measure of cost, and that's uh, pr some of the time it's prices. <laughs> uh, it, uh, but, of course, if the price falls too low, then we have a real problem. Uh, if the, you know, there's the cost of extraction and there's the selling price. But what we need to do is really have the price that the consumers are willing to pay be high enough relative to the cost that it takes for the, the, those who are extracting the oil or developing the other energy sources to produce those energy sources. If we have a situation where the cost of production of those energy sources is way high relative to the price in the marketplace, then we have problems. So what we really need is energy so types of energy that lower the total system costs, even when we consider the cost, say, of 
integrating a new source of electricity into the electric grid. We want to have s types of energy that make the whole system cost cheaper. A few conclusions with respect to energy return on energy invested. The, the changes in the energy return over invest, energy invested over time for a given fuel are useful for showing diminishing returns. And so this uh, calculation is valuable from this perspective. We can go, uh, we can look at how oil supply, for example, how it has been become relatively uh, more, more difficult to extract and how the energy return on energy invested has gone down over time. And so we have show factors, uh, something like 25 going down to 15, going down to 10, which is, which is not good, but it, it's showing how this changes over time. So it's valuable from being able to put a quantitative uh, approach to uh, measuring uh, diminishing returns. Another reason why energy return in, on energy invested is important is that if you firmly believe what I described as view two, which is that you're dealing with uh, a low fossil fuel supply, then when you, by following the uh, making energy return on energy invested as high as possible, what you'll do is you'll give, get an indication of what uh, fuels might maximize or may, might stretch out how long those fast fossil fuels will last. You, you have found the, uh, those fuels that use the fossil fuels most sparingly. So it works in this point of view. There are some issues though uh, in trying to compare, say, what wind to solar to this to the other thing is just because there's so many different kinds of energy types. Uh, if a person strongly believes view one, which is that our big issue is that we need low cost, then energy return on energy and invested estimates are not really as helpful. What we really need to do is look at the full cost of integrating the new fuel into the system. Uh, energy return on energy invested is really kind of a shortcut method. And it's a shortcut method that works in certain situations. It probably worked pretty well back in 1972. But as we get into this more complicated situation now where we have leasing of uh, land and fracking and all of these things, it becomes more difficult uh, to get something that's really comparable to uh, the situation. Uh, the situation becomes harder to, to model and to reduce to a single number. And certainly trying to compare uh, intermittent renewables like wind and solar to oil, it becomes uh, difficult to get uh, a one figure that is really a good figure for comparing. Uh, one uh, type of energy to another. So the question is, what exactly is the correct story? I got involved with this story pretty late. Uh, really, I, I didn't get involved fully until about 2007. I, I first read about the story back in 2005. Uh, and when I did get involved, I had the benefit of the work of others. I uh, got involved, I, I first started writing articles when I still was working in insurance consulting and uh, I then uh, eventually became friends with some of the people who were involved with this, uh, including Dr. Charles Hall and Dr. Dennis Meadows. And I had the benefit, of, by starting late, I wasn't already uh, deeply involved with one particular view as changes started happening so I could develop my own views looking based on what was happening right then. So I had the benefit of what was actually happening and I could start uh, seeing what kind of views, uh, what might really be going on. My background was different because I came at this from uh, 
the point of view of being an actuary uh, working in the insurance field. Here I was developing models trying to figure out uh, how uh, different insurance policies, how much we would pay in the future, how insurance companies might uh, operate and uh, what kind of profits and investment income and dividends and all kinds of things. Uh, so I was looking at forecasting the future but uh, on a different basis uh, it, it wasn't exactly following what the economists were saying, it was more from a practical point of view. And I happened to be involved way back in 1973-74 and I discovered back then that uh, there were companies that when we had high oil prices they had a very adverse effect on insurance companies. And I knew that if they had an adverse effect on insurance companies, they'd also have an adverse effect on banks. Uh, so I realized that you know, the situation uh, was different than what some people were looking at it, or at least it was more complicated than what people were looking at it. People who come from the point of view of being geologists or come from the point of view of being ecologists brought some points of view, but it, you kind of needed to add a few more things to it. So the situation, I could add a little bit of coming from a different point of view. One of the things I did do then, uh, in early 2008, I wrote a, a, an article that was posted online on the uh, website that I wrote at, at the time, which was the, theoildrum.com, uh, which for correctly forecast the collapse that took pl place in 2008. And uh, Professor Charles Hall wrote to me and he asked me if I would come to an upcoming uh, conference that he was planning and if I would give a talk on what I saw and why I had forecast uh, ahead of time what might happen in 2008. This was something that not too many people had foreseen in advance. And uh, so this is the way I became acquainted with him. I also, along the way, even prior to this, I became, I first became a writer at theoildrum.com, which was sort of a group website looking into energy and oil uh, shortages and how this might play out and exactly what we're looking at if we're reaching limits in a finite world. And uh, after I became a contributor there, I became an editor there as well. And uh, in the process of becoming an editor, I happened to correspond with uh, Dr. Dennis Meadows. So uh, I became acquainted with him as well. And I became acquainted with quite a few others who were involved with the energy system. And through that, I was able to learn at least a little bit about how the whole system works uh, how, uh, how th some of the details that aren't immediately obvious unless you start getting it down to the, the detailed data. And uh, I, from my background as an actuary, I also uh, was one who looked at the data that the various agencies put out, the government agencies put out on how much oil was extracted each year. I also looked at economic data. So I was familiar with a variety of uh, sources and could add some more too uh, and, and did my own analysis. One of the kinds of things too I got help from was the commenters on the oil drum and also from my own site ourfiniteworld.com. Uh, these uh, commenters would uh, write to me and they would say oh, you know, you didn't, have you thought about what so-and-so said? Or, you know, I don't really believe what you're saying is correct because uh, there's some new research that's been done in a particular area that you should know about. So I would follow up and looking at these kinds of things and add to what I had done. And so gradually I kind of build up a different story from what the, the standard peak oil story was. 
And so this is really the story I'm telling in this series of lectures, is really the view I've come up with, which is sort of, it's closely related to the peak oil theory in terms of its being a, a limit story, but it's not quite the same story because uh, low prices become as big an issue as high prices. Uh, this is a picture that was taken with uh, me and with uh, Professor Charles Hall and with uh, Professor Fong, who is, of course, here at the university. And this is when I came in 2011 and visited the university with my husband. Uh, just to mention a few more things, uh, the mainstream view of economists, and to some extent peak oilers, is that basically we have a supply issue. There's not enough fossil fuels in the ground, or otherwise maybe it's, uh, maybe a different version of the supply issue is that we, maybe there's plenty of fossil fuels in the ground, but those fossil fuels are too damaging from a point of climate change, so we really can't use them all. But at any rate, we need to have a small amount of fossil fuels here. So that's what their view is of the big, uh, the big issue is that there's not enough. So, uh, but, so what happens is that we start with an available supply of many resources, like fossil fuels, metal ores, and fresh water, and the extraction becomes more difficult. It tends to use more energy products. And what happens then is that the, even the pollution problem some, can sometimes be handled by uh, using more energy products. But what happens then is that uh, as we use more energy products, the prices, uh, the cost of extraction rises, and the, the prices are expected to keep rising as well. And the expectation is that the whole system is going to operate as in the past. It's just that the costs keep getting higher. So the view is that it, all we're doing is we're extracting it, but the costs are getting higher, and so there's higher prices. Uh, and then the view is that if it's a supply issue, we should be able to adapt. All we need to do is lower our standards of living somewhat. You know, each of us live more simply, and, and maybe everything will work out. Uh, what the view is in terms of uh, how the supply comes out, I mentioned earlier about the Hubbard curve, which is kind of this slow rounded curve. If the amount extracted in an given area tends to decline slowly, then the view was that, well, maybe the world would also uh, defy, extra, decline slowly. And uh, all we needed to do was find some way of kind of bringing the, bring the total up and adapt ourselves to it, and everything would work out fine if we kept adding new kinds of new fuels and we could bring the whole thing uh, so it worked better. Uh, part two, another part of this whole story, too, is that the financial system is uh, believed to determine prices. So here I'm talking about that the regulators can raise the prices. Uh, they can change things by uh, printing more money, uh, or they can give, uh, they can change the interest rates and give uh, consumers more ability to buy things. So uh, what's the belief is that, you know, while we may have a supply problem, these, these regulators and the government and the financial system can make it all work out right. And it, we can do this over a long period of years, and we can substitute over a long period of years. The substitution becomes a major part of the solution, uh, but it doesn't have to be near-term substitution, it can be over many, many years. The timing of the crisis is very distant, so this substitution can uh, take place in this way. My view, though, is a different one. The problem is one of affordability. 
the energy prices are likely to be too low for the producers. And when they're too low for the producers, then uh, you have a kind of a period that is kind of a strange one, which is the one we're going through right now. And that is when you actually have more oil uh, being produced uh, than what the consumers will buy. And that's because of a time lag that takes place uh, in, you know, your production, oil production doesn't stop instantly if oil prices go down. And what happens if the uh, system is not working right because of these high oil prices is that you end up with a glut. And it looks like you have a financial, what you end up with is a financial problem. Uh, you know, with the recession, debt defaults, and inability to collect enough taxes. The, the, it, it's really more, it's partly because of time lags in this that it doesn't really play out quite the way you'd expect. But the, the big issue is that if the oil prices are too low for the producers, they will stop producing the oil. It may not happen immediately, but it happens pretty quickly. And the problem is very difficult to fix. What we really need if we want the economy to continue growing or, uh, is to, we need very large amounts of very low priced energy products. And these energy products must in fact actually match the built infrastructure. So we need to have enough uh, oil, we need enough coal, we need enough natural gas. We need to actually match what uh, people are using. In fact, we need diesel separate from gasoline, for example. Uh, so this uh, it, what and what also happens is this, is that uh, with the substitution is that the substitution uh, occurs mostly across countries. We think of substitution as going from one fuel to another, but what happens is if one country has higher cost fuels because the price goes up, they become less competitive. So your substitution doesn't necessarily go quite the way you would think it goes. What happens is that the countries that have high priced fuels, and I'm thinking of Europe and uh, the United States particularly, uh, they found back uh, as oil prices rose in the 2005 to 2008 period that they were becoming less competitive with uh, China and India that used more coal as part of their energy mix. So you know, this too makes it a problem. You don't just uh, transfer to higher priced fuels because there's substitution across countries. What ultimately happens if energy prices are too low is that energy extraction stops. And this is the big concern. So we will talk more about this in the sessions that come up as to how exactly all of this uh, works out and plays together. Uh, and I will try to answer your questions as you have them.